Hi guys, yes I said that my previous video was the last one before we set off solving all these physical problems but I do think it's right we just spent one lesson consolidating quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. We want to see when we need to use quantum mechanics or even when the use of classical mechanics is enough for the analysis of the problem. It'll be a short video and it's just about consolidating quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. Alright, so early in my series, I talked about the failure of classical mechanics in the microscopic world. There's experimental evidence to show that. But we must also acknowledge that classical mechanics is valid in the macroscopic world. This macroscopic world is basically the world that we see with our eyes. Anything of the dealing with motion of say cars, tables, chairs, spaceships, or even planetary motion, what we can see in our eyes, classical mechanics suffices. It's enough to use to analyze the macroscopic world. But we also know that it fails in analyzing the microscopic world, okay? Classical mechanics does not work. So the thing is this, if quantum mechanics is to be considered the more general theory, it should really have results which correspond to classical mechanics in a certain limit, okay? In a certain limit where conditions are obeyed, the results obtained by class quantum mechanics should correspond with that of classical mechanics. Uh, if you want to use that theory, really, we say that classical mechanics has to be a subset of quantum mechanics. Yes, quantum mechanics does work in a microscopic world, but it should also work in a macroscopic world given certain conditions. So, it does beg the question. How does one decide when to use quantum or classical mechanics? Now, fortunately for us, the answer is very easy. The answer is this. By comparing the size of those quantities of the system with Planck's constant, h, which is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. Now, I know that we use Planck's constant reduced a lot in our problems of quantum mechanics, which is h-bar, but h-bar is h divided by 2 pi. So, 2 pi is about 6.2. So, the order is about the same, okay? What is more important now is the order. Uh, which is 10 to the minus 34. So we really want to see or really want to consolidate the two by comparing the, the size of the quantities of the system with Planck's constant which is given by that. And this occurs in two cases, all right? This occurs in two cases and here's the, the first case. It happens when a variable of the system is too large compared with h. When this happens, we describe the limit as h tends towards zero. Now, I know this is not totally accurate mathematically if you want to talk about the definition of limits, but what we're just trying to say is that the, the presence of H or H gives a very uh, a result which when we compare to the other variables is very small. So that's why we say uh, H tends towards zero. Now, we want to recall for a microscopic system, the size of the variables are of the order H or H bar. Okay, for example, the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom, the angular momentum, which we'll soon uh, calculate uh, for our next problems, is equal to n multiplied by h bar. Now, n is finite, okay? So, n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, as we can see, that this h bar is, ha is significant because the angular momentum, which is the dynamical quantity of the system, um, does include h bar, okay? And likewise, for the energy. The energy, we know, is n, pl uh, n plus half multiplied by mega multiplied by h bar. Again, we see this h bar over here. Now these results, you need not necessarily know how to derive, but any modern physics freshman course would give you these results. So if you see H or H bar, we know that yes, we need to use quantum mechanics because the presence of the H or the H bar is significant. I bet you that in your, your Newton laws of motion course, okay, you, you don't have this idea of seeing H or H bar. You don't see that terms at all. That's why we say that H tends towards zero. They are insignificant, okay? And that is why in those cases, New, uh, Newton's theory of motion, uh, classical mechanics is enough for the analysis of the problem. But when you see H and H bar, the use of quantum mechanics is unavoidable. We need to use quantum mechanics. Now, the second case, which I believe is the one that we'll use more often and it's maybe easier to understand, is by means of the wavelength. We know that the Broglie's hypothesis, lambda is equals to h divided by momentum, right? So any sort of object has an associated wavelength. And the classical domain is defined when lambda tends towards zero. Again, similar when I say uh, h tends towards zero. Now, when I say that lambda tends towards zero, what I'm trying to say is that the wavelength nature of the object is given by the Broglie's hypothesis is insignificant. So we don't have any of this idea of looking at the wavelength of the object because the wavelength is given by zero over here. Now when this happens, we can enter the classical domain and we can just use classical mechanics to analyze the problem. Now we just want to put in some digits to really get a feel of this. Uh, very easy. Let's just say we talk about an electron, which we all know um, is something in the microscopic world. So lambda is equal to h divided by momentum, right? h1 is h. h is of the order 10 to the minus 34. Now I'll divide that by the momentum which is mv for an electron the momentum is of the order 10 to the minus 31. 
and obviously we got the velocity which, which is of a certain order but as you can see this 10 to the minus 31 is enough to increase the, the power of the, the wavelength to something more respectable or something more significant like maybe um, 10 to the minus 3 okay you divide by the velocity you get something high so then so we can see that lambda is significant okay in the microscopic sense but when we go to the Ma microscopic world, okay, lambda, let's just say take a car, we got 10 to the minus 34, a car uh, mass is about maybe 500 kg, so we divide by 500, the order is only is already 10 to the minus 33, it's insignificant, right? 10 to what, 0, so uh, minus uh, 10 to the minus 31. So as you can see, this case, lambda 10 to what, 0, the use of classical mechanics is enough. So, in conclusion, what we say is that the classical limit is defined by the limit as h tends towards zero or when lambda tends towards zero. And when this happens, the results yielded by quantum mechanics should correspond to that of classical mechanics, right? When these conditions are satisfied. Alright, that's why sometimes we say that classical mechanics is the short wavelength version of quantum mechanics as shown by here, lambda tends towards zero. And I guess for some um, his historical facts, uh, Niels Bohr, one of the, the pioneers in quantum mechanics, really say that um, when this happens, the quantum dynamic quantities should correspond to the classical counterparts, okay, the dynamic quantities when these conditions are met. And that is what is known as the correspondence principle. Okay, but that's, uh, we, really, we don't really need to know that. But what we need to know is that in these limits, okay, classical mechanics is enough. But when we have this idea of h bar h appearing in our equations, we be sure to use quantum mechanics. And that is what we're going to do for all our problems from now. Thanks.